I want to make my own physics engine from scratch using C++ and OpenGL. Well, I've never done any graphics programming, so I went to learnopengl.com. Following this excellent guide, as well as a video tutorial series by Victor Gordon, I was able to draw a triangle. The inner workings of OpenGL is still a mystery to me, but in practice, you simply define the 3D coordinates for the vertices and the vertex order for the triangles to be drawn. This is then stored in buffers and sent through the graphics pipeline to end up on the screen. At this stage, we only control two steps of the graphics pipeline, the vertex shader and the fragment shader, both of which are written in OpenGL shader language, GLSL. The vertex shader lets us modify the vertices using, for example, scalings and rotations. The fragment shader lets us change the color of each pixel to be drawn. Continuing with the tutorials, we're now able to add a texture to our triangle. Now, before moving on to the three-dimensional world, let's briefly talk about the spaces and matrices that are used in 3D rendering. The model matrix contains the information about the position and orientation of our object. Using the model matrix, we transform the coordinates of our object relative to its local origin to world coordinates in world space. In world space, we can have multiple objects with different positions and orientations defined by their very own model matrices. A 3D scene has a camera that defines the position and direction we want to view the scene from. A view matrix is used to rotate and move the objects to arrange them as seen from the camera's point of view, the view space. Lastly, we have the projection matrix, which is part of the process of taking our three-dimensional coordinates and turning them into two-dimensional coordinates that can be displayed on our 2D screens. This takes the camera's perspective into account, making objects further away appear smaller than objects closer to the camera. Combining these matrices, we get what is commonly called the MVP matrix. This gets multiplied to the vertices of our objects in the vertex shader. Now, instead of defining these matrices by hand, we're going to use the library GLM which gives us functions for creating the view and projection matrix, as well as helping us manipulate the model matrix to get the rotations and translations we want. Our first 3D model will be a pyramid. After defining the vertex coordinates and the vertex order, called indices, we use GLM to create the projection and view matrix. The model matrix is just a unit matrix for now. We send these matrices to the vertex shader. Here we want to use these matrices to transform the vertex coordinates. This is done by multiplying the projection times the view times the model matrix with the vertices, not the other way around as the name MVP matrix might have you believe. I initially did this and it took me quite a while to realize that MVP actually refers to the order of transformations rather than the order of multiplication. Eventually, I ended up with this cow textured pyramid. It's hard to tell that it's in three dimensions though. To better see this, we can use GLM to add a small rotation to the model matrix every fraction of a second to get a spinning effect. Now pyramids are nice and all, but I would like to render a sphere. Like everything else, a rendered sphere is made of a bunch of triangles. So we need to define the coordinates for the vertices that will make up these triangles. There are multiple ways of doing this. One approach involves dividing the sphere into stacks and sectors. By defining a range of longitudinal angles from 0 to 2 pi and a range of latitudinal angles from pi half to minus pi half. If we loop through these angles in a nested for loop, we can find the coordinates of each vertex using this formula. We can then use these vertices to create the triangles we need. So after a couple of tries, I ended up with this. Alright, so there's obviously something wrong with the texture coordinates, but other than that, it does very much look like a sphere. Now we can finally start with the physics, so let's make a class representing a physical body. This class will store the position, velocity and acceleration of the body, as well as the orientation, the angular velocity and the angular acceleration of the body. Now this is all pretty straightforward, except for one thing, the orientation. Here we have some alternatives, like Euler angles and rotation matrices, However, we're going to use quaternions. Quaternions are a four-dimensional imaginary number and they're pretty fucking useless with one exception. And this exception is, luckily for us, describing three-dimensional rotations and orientation. Without going into too much detail, a unit length quaternion on this form can efficiently store an orientation. The physics body class also needs a function for updating its state. 
This will take in the argument delta time to control how far in time we update the state. Let's start by ignoring rotations and simply update the position by adding velocity times delta time. We also update the velocity by adding delta time times the acceleration. I also made a class for the model which contains all the geometrical data we need, like the vertices and the indexes. Indices. Index? This class keeps track of what shader to use when rendering and what texture to apply to the model. It also stores its own model matrix as well as function for initialization and rendering. Finally, I combine these two classes into a body class. Here we have a function called render model, which takes the position of the physical body and creates a translation matrix using GLM translates. Then the orientation is used to create a rotation matrix with the help of 2mat4, which converts the quaternion to a rotation matrix. These matrices are then combined to create the model matrix, which is assigned to the model. And finally, the model's own render function is called rendering the model. Let's create a physical sphere and initialize it with an acceleration of 9.8 meters per square second in the minus z direction to represent gravity. In the main loop, we can use glfGetTime function to see if delta time has elapsed. If it has, we call the update state and render model function. Alright, so we got some movement, but let's add some collision. We can do this by checking the vertical position of the body in the update state function. If the vertical position gets below 1, we move it back to 1 and reverse the velocity with some dampening. Alright, now we're getting somewhere. This is a very crude way to handle collisions though, and the ball will not stop bouncing regardless of how long we wait. This can be solved somewhat by decreasing delta time, but it's an inherent problem to our current solution. Instead of fixing that though, let's make the scene a bit nicer to look at. I wanted the game engine grid kind of vibe with no idea how to achieve it. Luckily, I found this blog post by Marie, who is a programmer. And she does exactly what I want using only shaders. Unfortunately, I couldn't just copy the code, mainly because I've decided to use the Z axis as the vertical axis, like any sensible person would do. However, the standard in graphics programming seems to be to use the Y axis as the vertical axis. After mindlessly swapping axes around, I did eventually manage to get a working grid. Now with something easier on the ice, we can move back to the physics. We're gonna want to apply forces to the bodies, so let's add a mass variable and a function called apply force. Here we invoke Newton's second law to get the resulting acceleration. To save some computation time and avoid division by zero, we can define a variable for the inverse mass as well and use this in the function. Torque gives rise to angular acceleration according to this formula. This can be seen as the rotational equivalent of Newton's second law where force is replaced by torque and mass is replaced by the moment of inertia matrix. The spherical symmetry of our body makes the moment of inertia matrix quite simple for now. Again, we can define the inverse of the matrix to save some computation time. In anticipation of adding more bodies to the simulation, I also created this function called body system. This will store multiple bodies and it will also take over the responsibility of updating the bodies. Here in the update state function, we need to deal with the rotational aspect so we can get the torque to act on our sphere. The angular velocity gets updated in the same manner as position and velocity. We simply add the angular acceleration times delta time. The orientation, however, is expressed as a quaternion in a global reference system, while our angular velocity is a vector in the bodyfix reference system. The time derivative of the orientation quaternion can be expressed like this, where w is a quaternion made from the angular velocity like this. Now we can approximate the new orientation by multiplying this derivative by delta time and adding this to our orientation. This approximation also requires that we normalize our orientation quaternion each step to ensure it is of unit length. In our main loop, we can now trigger these functions on key presses. With forces and torques in place, we can start working on an actual collision response. To make the collision a bit more interesting, let's place our ball in a dome. The collision response method we're gonna use will be inspired by the soft body approach described in this paper by Jonathan Fleischmann. 
The collision force is described by a tangential component lying in the contact plane and a normal component orthogonal to the contact plane. The normal displacement is defined as the interpenetration of the bodies in the normal direction. This is multiplied by a normal stiffness coefficient to get the first term in our normal force. The tangential displacement is defined as the movement along the contact plane since the start of the collision. This is multiplied by a tangential stiffness coefficient to get the first term in the tangential force. The second term in the forces consists of the velocity in each direction multiplied by a dampening coefficient and the effective mass of the two colliding bodies, indexed as i and j, giving us the final expression for the collision force. To implement this, we need to easily convert vectors between the global reference frame and the body fixed reference frame. When using rotation matrices, the transformation of a vector s in the local reference system to the global would be done like this, where a is the orientation matrix. To go from local to global, we multiply the expression with the transpose of the orientation matrix from the left. The quaternion equivalent of this looks like this where the star indicates the quaternion conjugate and the vectors are expressed as quaternions with no real part. The GLM library has implemented an optimized version of this, which is called when one uses the star operator between a quaternion and a vec3. This means we can write our transformation functions like this. With the transformations in place, we can start with the normal force. First, we detect any overlap between our sphere and the dome, by checking that the distance of the sphere from the dome center is greater than the dome radius minus the ball radius. When an overlap is found, we call a resolve collision with dome function. In this function, we start by calculating the normal vector of the collision plane by normalizing the position of the ball relative to the dome center and flipping the sign. Then we calculate the position of the contact point in the global reference frame as the sphere position minus the normal times the radius. We also calculate the contact point in the local reference frame using our get local position function. Next, we need the relative velocity between the sphere and the dome at the contact point. Now, because the dome is stationary, this is just the velocity of the contact point. To calculate this, we create a get velocity at point function. We get the velocity of the point due to rotation of the sphere by taking the cross product of the angular velocity and the point. This is then multiplied by the orientation to transform it to the global reference frame. Then we add the linear velocity, which is already expressed in the global frame. With the relative velocity calculated, we can get the normal velocity by projecting the velocity on the normal vector. Next, we calculate the normal displacement by multiplying the interpenetration depth with the normal vector. Lastly, we define the normal stiffness and dampening coefficient, and we calculate and apply the normal force. So let's see what it looks like. As expected, the sphere bounces off the floor due to the normal force. And when we apply some sideways force, the sphere follows the curvature of the dome. We don't, however, get any rotation. It only slides along the surface. Likewise, if we apply some torque to a stationary sphere, it will just spin in place. For this to take effect, we need the tangential collision force. To get the tangential force, we first need the tangential velocity. Now since we've already calculated the normal velocity, we can just subtract this from the relative velocity to get the tangential velocity. Next we need the tangential displacement. This will be approximated as delta time times the tangential velocity. Again this represents the movement of the contact point in the tangent direction since the start of the collision. We then define the tangential stiffness and dampening coefficient and we calculate the force. Before we apply the force, we will take the column friction law into account, which states that the force of friction is less or equal to the normal force times a friction coefficient. To apply the force, we need a new function called apply force at point, because unlike the normal force, the tangential force does not act through the center of mass of our sphere. In this function, we first convert the force to the local reference frame and then use the local force to calculate the torque by taking the cross product with the contact point. We then apply the torque and force.
With the tangential force in place, when we apply a sideways force, we can see that the friction is causing it to roll on the dome surface. We can also see that the spinning sphere gets affected by the tangential force. As a final step, let's add some more spheres. Detecting a collision between two spheres is quite simple. We just loop over all the pairs of spheres and check if the distance between them is smaller than the sum of their radii. To resolve a collision, we need to make some slight changes to our dome collision function. We need a contact point expressed in the local coordinate system for each sphere to calculate the velocity of each point. Then we get the relative velocity simply by taking the difference between the velocities. Lastly, we apply the forces to both spheres in opposite directions. That is it for now. I hope you learned something, or at least found it interesting. I would like to continue working on this, and there is a lot that can be done. Like improving the graphics and performance, or implementing a more general collision detection algorithm. If you have any suggestions, feel free to comment and keep an eye out for the next video. Thank mm -hmm. you.